Okay. Can I start? Yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Cody Silva, and today I'm going to present my thesis with the title Impact of Arctic Environmental Conditions on the Reproduction and Recruitment of Alaris Colenta and Laminara Digitata. This thesis work was conducted at CCMR in the University of Algarve. So, kelp forests are one of the most productive ecosystems worldwide, and they can absorb up to more than 10 times carbon than the primary production of the marine phytoplankton. They are important habitat structuring elements, as well they provide food for a diverse array of marine organisms. So, laminaria have a thermophilic life cycle, which means that they alternate between microscopic and macroscopic stages. So, the adult sporophytes release the spores, and the spores will eventually germinate into gametophytes. Female gametophytes undergo gametogenesis and form the ogonia, which will form the egg. Male gametophytes form the antheridia, which will produce the sperm that eventually fertilize the egg and will produce the juvenile sporophyte. So, uh, the two kelp macroalgae uh, under study, Elaria esculenta and Laminaria digitata, were collected in Kongsfjorden, Spitsbergen, which is characterized as an Arctic environment with low temperatures all seasons, long periods of snow and ice cover, and pronounced seasonal variations in light climate and day length, which range from several months in the, of complete darkness, known as polar nights, to permanent sunlight in the summer, known as polar days. So, Alaris Clint and Laminar Digitata are perennial cap species and they are reproductive during the summer. In Kongsfjorda, they can occur between 0 and 15 meters. So, just to clarify, Alaria Esculenta is going to be called Alaria and Laminar Digitata is going to be called Laminaria at most of the cases. So, in this thesis work, we did two studies. And so, for the first study, it's important to say that literature on the gametophyte's capacity to recover after unfavorable environmental conditions are scarce. And so, the aim of the first study was to obtain a better understanding of the gametophyte's capacity to recruit after unfavorable environmental conditions. And so, the hypothesis is that both species will present different recruitment patterns or conditions improve. For the second study that we did, it's relevant to say that literature on the influence of kelp canopy shading on gametophyte's development does not exist. And so, the aim of the second study was to provide insights into the effect of parental kelp canopy on the survival and female reproductive success of gametophytes and recruitment capacity and their current, and, their current and projected Arctic summer sea water temperatures and nutrient levels. And so the hypothesis is that parental kelp canopy will play a fundamental role in the reproductive performance and sporophyte recruitment capacity under different temperatures and nutrient levels. I'm sorry. So I'm going to explain the experiment of the first study. So first of all, male and female gametophytes of one of each species were equally distributed to the corresponding glass speakers, and they were filled with artificial seawater supplemented with nitrate and phosphate concentrations, which corresponds to the levels of the seawater in Kongsfjorden during the winter season. So at day zero, we took data on growth and density, and then we transferred them to Arctic winter um, conditions, where we exposed them to a photo period of, of 24 hours of complete darkness in order to simulate the polar nights and the two degrees of temperatures, which simulate the temperature in Kongsfjorden during the winter. So after th uh, 38 and 60 days, we took data on growth, density, and female ontogenic stages. After 60 days, we transferred the correspondent uh, beakers to uh, Arctic spring uh, conditions where he exposed them to a photo period of 12-12 light dark hours cycle and a light intensity of 15 micromoles, which represents the irradiance under a dense kelp canopy during the spring. We also exposed them to five degrees of temperature in order to simulate the slight increase of temperature from winter to spring. So after 20, 28 days under spring conditions, we took data on density and female ontogenic stages, and after 36 days, we took data on density and recruitment. So, how we process and analyze the data? So, for the growth, we measure the area of the gametophytes for the winter days, and we obtain the data through the analysis of photography data using image uh, process uh, software, which was ImageJ. For the density, we count the gametophytes for the winter and winter spring days. Both growth and density data was statistically analyzed through repeater measures one way and over. For the female ontogenic stages, we count the female gametophytes in vegetative, egg, and sporophyte state after 28 days under spring conditions. Then we sum the percentage of egg and sporophytes in order to obtain the female reproductive gametophytes percentage. So, and for the recruitment, we count the sporophytes per female gametophytes. And we did this after 36 days uh, under uh, spring conditions. So both female reproductive gametophytes percentage and recruitment was statistically analyzed through a non-parametric test, man with U. 
So jumping to the results, here we have the growth of both species under Arctic winter conditions. And on the y-axis, we have uh, the uh, normalized gametophytes area. And on the x-axis, we have the days. So as you can see, for both species under Arctic winter conditions, the growth was suspended. So we didn't observe any significant uh, growth differences for both species. Where for the density, as we can see here, um, for both species at a decrease of, uh, of density, so have a significant mortality after 38 days, with laminaria showing a higher mortality than alaria. So for the winter-spring uh, density data, first of all, I want to mention that for this data analysis, we only consider the day zero and the day 60 under winter conditions. However, what is important to notice here is that alaria under spring conditions had a significant decrease of density, so had a significant mortality, whereas for laminaria, that was not observed. So this decrease of density of alaria was not expected because Arctic spring conditions are favorable conditions for reproduction. What happened here was that alaria didn't recover from winter to spring conditions, and then the gametophytes start to die. So, analyzing the female ontogenic stages after 28 days in spring, we observed that the highest percentage of the female ontogenic stages of alaria, as we can see, lies on the vegetative state which means, again, that the gametophytes didn't recover from winter to spring conditions, and so they didn't become reproductive, as we can see. Whereas for laminaria, we can see here that the highest uh, female ontogenic stages percentage for laminaria lays on the sporophyte state, which means that the gametophytes of, of laminaria I'm sorry, become reproductive, and so they recover efficiently from winter to spring conditions. This becomes more evident on this box plot, where laminaria had 18 times more female reproductive gametophytes percentage than alaria. So, for the recruitment, we can corroborate what we saw on the reproduction, where laminaria had 62 times more sporophytes per female gametophytes than alaria. So, Jumping now to our second study, I'm going to explain the laboratory experiment. We did a multifactorial experiment. So, again, male and female gametophytes of one of each species were equally distributed to the correspondent petri dishes. Half of the total samples were filled with artificial seawater supplemented with nitrate and phosphate concentrations, which correspond to the levels in Kongsfjorden of the seawater in Kongsfjorden during the summer season. And the other half was filled with artificial seawater supplemented with nitrate and phosphate projected concentrations of the seawater in the Arctic during the summer under climate change scenarios. Afterwards, the, the gametophytes were exposed to three different light intensities, which corresponds to the irradiance under a determinate kelp canopy density. So the, the lowest light intensity, as we can see here, it represents the, the irradiance under a very dense kelp canopy. The medium light intensity, it represents the irradiance under intermediate kelp canopy. And the highest light intensity, it represents no kelp canopy shading. This irradiance was on for 24 hours in order to simulate the permanent sunlight in the summer known as polar days. We also exposed them to two different temperatures. Five degrees is the current temperature in Kongsfjorden during the summer, and the nine degrees is the projected temperature for the seawater in the summer uh, for the end of the century, so in 2100. So again, how we process and analyze the data. So for the density, we count the gametophytes for the 0 and 36. We statistically analyze this data through a multifactorial ANOVA. For the female autogenic stages, we measure, we counted this at the day 28 with the same procedures as already explained on the first study. And the recruitment, we measure at the day 36, and we did the same procedures as already explained on the first, on the experiment, on the study one. So both female reproductive gametophytes and recruitment data was statistically analyzed through a non-parametric multifactorial design. Okay, so now jumping to, to the results for the density. First of all, on the y-axis, we have the normalized gametophyte density. On the x-axis, we have the combination of the two temperatures and two nutrient concentrations. And on the upper right corner, we have the different colors, which represents the different light intensities. So first of all, what I want to say here is that a laria at a higher density compared to laminaria. So it's, in other words, it's, it's, it means that a laria at a higher survival compared to laminaria. Okay, what is highlighted here is that independent of the other environmental conditions, when both species were exposed to the highest light intensity, so no kelp canopy shading, we observe the, the highest mortality 
for both species. So right now we can we can see and understand the importance of parental kelp canopy in sustaining higher gametophytes density for both species. Now for the female reproductive gametophytes, we can see that Alaria in general has a higher percentage of female reproductive gametophytes than Laminaria. So I want to highlight a pattern here, but with different light intensity. So starting on Laria, we can see that the female gametophytes didn't become reproductive under, sorry, under the um, under the lowest light intensity. So under a very dense kelp canopy, which means that the gametophytes in this stage were in, were in dormant state, so they didn't become reproductive. So for Laria, the um, a, a, a very dense kelp canopy could jeopardize the reproductive success of the gametophytes, where for laminaria at the highest light intensity, the gametophytes didn't become reproductive, the female gametophytes, I'm sorry, because, um, because they just start to die with this light intensity. So right now we can see that laminaria had a higher dependence than uh, uh, laria for the reproductive of uh, the female gametophytes. Now for the recruitment, Again, uh, we can see that in general, Alaria had the higher sporophytes per female gametophytes than uh, Laminaria in general. So now, independent again of the other environmental conditions, we can see that at the intermediate kelp canopy, so at the medium light intensity, both species had in general their highest recruitment. So we can see the importance of parental kelp canopy in the enhance of the recruitment for both species. So finally, I want to highlight that the increase of temperature, so under climate change scenarios with the increase of the seawater temperature of 4 degrees will jeopardize the recruitment capacity of both species with a higher evidence for a Laria esculenta species. So the ecological relevance here is that a study from Barst et al. 2016 and noticed a kelp biomass increase and establishment of kelp in shallow areas that were not previously occupied before. And one of the main species responsible for biomass increase and appresentation encroachment was Laminaria. So when we go to the study where we exposed the gametophytes to Arctic summer and, and projected conditions, we saw that Alaria outcompete Laminaria on density, female reproductive gametophytes percentage, and recruitment. So we cannot we cannot justify what Bors saw and with this study. And on top of that, we saw that Laminaria didn't become reproductive at the highest light intensity, so no parental cap canopy. So when the, for the study, when we exposed the gametophytes from winter to spring conditions, we observed that laminaria had a higher capacity to recover from winter to spring conditions and outcompete laminaria with a higher female reproductive gametophytes percentage and a higher recruitment. So the fact that laminaria was responsible for the kelp biomass increase in Kongs Fjorden, it may be due to the capacity to recover from winter to, to the from winter conditions notwithstanding the dependence of parental kelp canopy uh, for upper zonation encroachment. So for the general conclusion, so for the first study, we saw that Alaria esculenta and Laminaria digitata suspend their growth under Arctic winter conditions. Uh, Laminaria digitata recover efficiently from Arctic winter to spring conditions and had a greater recruitment than Alaria esculenta. For the second study, we saw that parental kelp canopy had a significant influence in density, reproduction, and recruitment on both species, with Laminaria digitata showing a higher dependence on parental kelp canopy for reproduction. And also, predicted temperatures due to climate change will not severely affect Arctic kelp species because we didn't observe an abrupt mortality of both species, but changes in recruitment patterns, as we saw, could occur, leading to shifts in community structures. So, both studies highlight the importance of understanding environmental drivers for density patterns, reproduction, and recruitment of juvenile sporophytes. And finally, more research should be directed to the effect of winter conditions on Arctic kelp species, and future studies should take into account the light attenuation by parental kelp canopies when studying early life cycle stages of kelp. So thank you very much for your attention. I want to thank my promoter, Garrett Pearson, my supervisor, Nilsa Martins, for making this work possible. I want to thank my friends, my girlfriend, my family, and especially my parents for always believing in me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.